Welcome to season six of CX in the Wild with the global voice of CX, Dennis Wakabayashi. Embark on a safari into authentic conversations with emerging CX leaders and brands. The adventure starts now. Let's start out with who you are and what you do. So my name is Simon Chris and I run the CX Innovation Institute in Australia. And so we, we work with, the, with corporates um, around helping them innovate their CX journey for their customers um, with a really strong focus on the use of AI um, in, and how AI plays out in the CX space. Okay, well, all the listeners just turned up the volume on their cars and they want to hear what does that even mean? What is AI doing? Yeah, I, look, AI is, I keep saying AI is a little bit like fine wine. Everybody knows the term, everybody loves the taste, but ask people to explain it and they just don't know. Um, and that's very true for AI today. So in the CX space, there's there's actually a heap of use cases that have been promised for a very long time. And AI has been around for a very long time. But that promise has never really been delivered. And it's only now as we're starting to see generative AI come to the forefront and conversational AI get to a really superior level that some of these use cases can come about. And there's some that will be supporting the customer's experience. So, you know, chatbots and things like that. There'll be some that will be supporting the agent's experience. And then there are some that are just geared around operational efficiency. All right. Just my everybody who's I've ever talked to said chatbots are terrible. Mm -hmm. Are you telling me that AI is going to make chatbots bearable? Yeah, and and here's why. When you when you're doing a chatbot and you're doing it with conversational AI. Conversational AI is very good at soliciting data points. So if you're a travel service, it's a good example, you want to know departure city, departure date, departure time, those those data points, and it's very good at getting those. But it's terrible at holding a conversation. It's actually, conversational AI is the worst name for that product because it's really not conversational. And it feels clunky to humans. If you asked Siri to get you a list of 10 hotels in Bora Bora over Christmas. It understands hotel Bora Bora Christmas and it'll get you a list. If you then say, which one has a pool? Siri says, I don't understand the question because it treats each statement or each question as a discrete entity. Generative AI doesn't do that. Generative AI considers the entire discussion So if you ask that same thing of generative AI, which one has a pool, it understands the concept of one, meaning which hotel has a pool, without you needing to be explicit about it. And so the the bots that that we're heading towards will be a mixture of generative and conversational AI. Generative when we just want to talk with you like a human and conversational for when we want to elicit, solicit specific data points from you. Um, and a great example of that is anybody that has the Expedia app can go on there and right in the middle of the screen, it says, try our chat GPT enabled travel planner. Um, and you can just have a conversation with that about, I, I went in there the other day and I started with the statement, I love scuba diving. And it said, scuba diving's fantastic. Here's 10 places in the world you could do it. And I started having a conversation about scuba diving Next thing I know, we'd kind of settled on a location and it said, let me give you a list of five hotels in that location. But it was a discussion. It wasn't it. just asking specific questions and I had to answer specific answers. I feel like I have to do a, do some uh, a YouTube video on that. Yeah. So, okay. So you said you've convinced me you're super smart about AI. How did you get so smart about AI? Take me back to your origin story. Yeah, so I've been around CX for 35 years or more, um, predominantly in the operations side of contact centers, managing contact centers and all that. So for some of the world's big brands. And I'd been, keep, I'd been tracking AI for about the last 10 years on this promise that it was going to deliver some amazing benefits for contact centers and never seeing it 
They're hearing all the hype, hearing all the talk, never seeing it. Then about four years ago, generative AI started to pop up. Um, and I was still reading about it and following it. And that looked more promising. But as they started to work on language models, it started to really make sense that that could work. And then, of course, when OpenAI just democratized it late last year, it kind of opened up to everybody to kind of go, wow, hang on, all of these use cases that we've been talking about can now actually come to fruition. And some of the use cases are incredibly simple but incredibly powerful, like summarizing post-call into your CRM system. Why are your agents sitting there writing up an after-call report? Have generative AI listen to the call and have it write the report. Really simple use case, but really powerful. It, it's 100% true, because a lot of times what I do when I have to write up the summary of these blogs, these uh, podcasts now, is I just drop the transcript into GPT and say, could you please just summarize this for me? This. I, I use it with research reports. I get a lot of white papers, a lot of um, scholastic research reports to read. I don't know why people think they need to send them to me. I'm not that smart. But uh, my favorite thing is to drop them into ChatGPT or into Claude 2 or Llama 2 and say to them, can you summarize this into three paragraphs so that a 12-year-old can understand it? That's about my mental capacity. And so... <laughs> Um, it will then come out with a really simple summary. Now, if there's something in there that, you know, recently one report was all about Machiavellian intents within a large language model, pretty scintillating stuff, um, I asked it just to expand on that one point. And so it started to expand to the point where I said, okay, now I want to make the investment of going and reading the entire paper. You know, <clears throat> so I'll just tell you, I... I, because I explore so much in the world of customer experience and technology, I've always been uh, an explorer on the technologies since I was very young. Yeah. I programmed, I taught myself to program basic on a Commodore VIC-20 with 5K, 5K of RAM. Uh, those were the days. And I was 10 years old. So ever since then, when there's a tech new all it takes is one jargon word, and I'm like, what does this jargon word mean? Yeah. So last year, I, I knew these chatbots were going to come out. I knew AI was getting close. So I, um, I had heard about this, this woman who owned um, chatbots for the travel industry. Her co-founder passed away unexpectedly. Okay. And they were best friends, co-founders, had had a good, good run at the um, business. And sort of this gentleman was stolen from the life of this other person. Yeah, wow. And so she took all of their old um, text messages and all of their old emails and put them into a large language model. Into a replica, probably. Yeah, yeah. So I decided... I want to figure out how good these things are. So I said it uh, for 30 days. I just talked to this replica for 30 days to understand the challenge and the response and the depth of memory that this, the conversation, the continuity in the conversation. And I was like, eh, like, I don't know. Did you ever program computers when you were young? right back at the same kind of point you did. I right. learned basic and I learned COBOL and then I kind of stopped. The first, first program I ever wrote was a program that I attempted to get the, the computer to talk back to me. So I would say, I would turn it on and it would say, hi, how are you? Multiple choice question. And then I would respond. And then I try to get it to generate random answers. And so I was always fascinated with this. And Replica was very similar to that experience. The challenge and the response, the randomness, there was a little bit more continuity. But I realized then that um, halfway through the experiment, I was like, I get it. But then I got in a conversation with it about uh, mathematics and the universe mm -hmm. and infinity. So I started quizzing it at about infinity. What is infinity? 
you know, what does infinity mean to your AI model? And the, the, the bot said, infinity is the most beautiful thing there is. And I was like, <clears throat> what exactly do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. And the language model said, infinity is a horizon that when you look at it mathematically, it extends forever. So if you think of it as a, a, a sunset on the ocean, it's a sunset on the ocean that lasts for as far and as forever as you can see it. Mm. And I said to myself, right then I was like, this AI thing is actually going to be something soon. Yeah. Because I had had a conversation that for a brief minute, I wasn't in a challenge and response mode. I suddenly was like, wait, what? <laughs> so I leaned in. So I think that 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 then that was that was in September of last year. So flash forward GPT, GPT four, we do see these chatbots, language models. But AI, to your point, is so much more than that. Being mm. an AI sommelier as you are, <laughs> what what kind of things are you thinking about today? I about I, AI? I love that you use the term sommelier too, because my master's degree at university was a master's degree in viticulture and wine technology. So <laughs> you've really you've really hit the nail on the head. Um, I'm 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 not thinking so much about use cases. There's a heap of use cases out there. I'm thinking more about our users, your listeners, people that are buying these AI products, are they aware of some of the inherent risks? And, I, you know, I don't want to be an alarmist and don't do it because it's too risky. I, the, the risks are all manageable. But are people aware of the risks? Are they thinking about these things the right way? Are they coming up with a really solid use case before they go and choose a product? Or are they just running out and buying the first thing that's got, you know, now with AI written on the box? Um, and so I'm spending a lot of my time working around that side of AI is making sure that organisations are aware and are ready for what they're about to unleash. Because if they unleash something good, that'll get magnified. If they release something bad, that's also going to get magnified. Um, and we've already seen a couple of horrible crashes uh, from people who just weren't ready and the wrong things Like happened. what? Name one. Uh, I can name a couple. So there was a, a, there's a supermarket chain in New Zealand, um, Park and Save, I think they're called, that uh, released this, this great little AI tool where you told it what you had in the fridge and it would give you a recipe. And that sounds like a great use case until some troll went in there and said, I only have bleach and this chemical and that chemical, and basically it gave it back a recipe for making chlorine gas, which is, you know, highly toxic and a pathogen. Um, so, you know, they just hadn't checked their guardrails that it couldn't be trolled. Um, similarly, the National Eating Disorder Association here in America had a, um, a great bot called Tessa that would give advice about eating disorders Somewhere there was a mix-up between them and the vendor and overnight they moved from conversational AI, highly structured, into generative AI, footloose and fancy free, without changing the temperature of how much it, you know, hallucinated. And so Monday morning it's telling people, oh, you should only eat 500 calories worth of food if you want to lose weight. And this is to people with eating disorders, you know, anorexia and, and similar um, so that bot had to be pulled down and kind of rebuilt and, you know, re railed And we're going to see these types of things in the very much the same way as the CX industry saw horrendous IVR builds when they first came out. You know, you would remember there were IVRs that were 27 options wide and 15 options deep, and you lost the will to live by the time you got out the other end. We're going to see similar stuff in AI unless people are really well planned, well informed about what they need to do to use the AI correctly. Fair enough. You mentioned that AI has been around for a while. Mm. What I don't think people immediately think of is that AI has been around for quite a while. And in fact, just about everything we do already is governed by AI. Tons. And 
you know, I think about social media algorithms. Mm -hmm. We don't, we don't, we think we subscribe to particular people, but we don't. We're, 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 um, we're served content based on an algorithm, you know, that is based on a vision, our, our own vision of ourselves. So it is sort of a little bit of a narcissistic it's reflective. very, it's very hedonistic. If you if you look at LinkedIn as a great example, if you want to get a post that really impresses well, put a selfie on it. If there is a picture of a human and ideally of yourself, that post will post higher and harder than if you just put in a picture of some of the lovely scenery like we have here today. So I want to I want to double click on that. I was at I think the Adobe conference. Um, at least seven years ago, eight years ago, James Franco was mm. the, the, the person in the fireside chat. And I'm like, why is James Franco talk at this <laughs> conference? Yeah. And, you know, it didn't make any sense to me at all why he was there. And in fact, you know, I, I probably wasn't the only one who, um, who thought that. I mean, his credibility in the Adobe uh, visual uh, software space, I just didn't feel was there. But the joke was on me because he said one thing that stuck with me more than almost any other speaker at any other conference, which was this, the, the, the moderator said, what, what have you learned about social media? And he said, um, it doesn't matter what you post on social media. I've posted everything. But if you post a picture of yourself on social media, that's what every what performs. And you're exactly right. You're also saying it now. So yep. I even believe it more now. Who knew James Franco was the new AI leader of our times, that's or right. you are? So, but, right. I, but artificial intelligence has been around. Actually, the term was termed back at Dartmouth College back in the 50s um, when they were trying to get funding to hold like a, a one-week in-house seminar to get a whole pile of scientists together to talk about how computers could be closer to humans. And they were trying to find a term for it that would, you know, that, that would do a bit of marketing for them and one of the guys came up with the term artificial intelligence, and it kind of stuck. Um, and the field kind of kicked off a little and then went into a massive winter where they really haven't done much with it. And it's only in the last 20 years that we've seen a lot of what they call ANI, right? Artificial narrow intelligence. And that is, it's designed to do a job, a driverless car. You predict what film you're going to want to watch on Netflix, predict whether or not we should give you a credit card, all of those narrow use cases. Um, and large language models aren't quite what they call AGI or artificial general intelligence, but it's definitely knocking on the door of artificial general, because artificial general intelligence is kind of where AI almost does become sentient and starts really replicating humans. Um, and Large language models are kind of knocking gently on that door, but it's still narrow artificial intelligence. Um, it's still designed to do a sp specific job. Uh, but, yeah, you, if, you've, if you've used Uber, if you've used Netflix, if you've used Facebook, all of those are full of AI computations. All right, we're going to get nerdy now. We're taking the, We're going to go down the AI iceberg right now. We're going to talk about neural networks? <laughs> well, we, we might. You, you tell me. First question, mm. because you brought up Netflix. How do you explain the Napoleon Dynamite problem? Which is? I, okay. Not aware of that. Okay. Whew, thank God. I know one thing to contribute to this conversation. <laughs> the Napoleon Dynamite problem is the problem in the Netflix algorithm that once a person watches Napoleon Dynamite, the algorithm cannot figure out what to suggest next. Nice. So it's been well documented. You can Google it. It's just a quandary. Napoleon Dynamite, you either love it or you hate it, but it's, it's not a romance. It's not really a comedy. It's not really an adventure movie. So 
there is there are things about human nature that to your point it's knocking on the door because if napoleon dynamite answers that door yeah. ai goes away and comes back yeah so there's that the other thing that i was going to ask you about is um <clears throat> With all of these algorithms, is the fear that the algorithm will um, do something polarizing or let's say good versus evil, or is the greater fear that AI will disrupt, disrupt the polarization so that there will truly only be one mode of thought? So let's address the two questions. The the Napoleon Bonaparte problem. Napoleon Dynamite. Uh, Napoleon Dynamite. Sorry. Um, is and it's it's a good film. Everyone loves the super stuff. Um, is that AI? Every AI, regardless of its use, is designed to do one thing and one thing only, and that is predict a probable outcome. Whatever it is, it's trying to predict an outcome. So uh, when Google, when um, yeah, Google Maps and Uber use it, they're trying. What if the car went this street and that street? No. What if the car went that street and that street? No. So it's trying to predict most probable which is the best path for it to take, which is the best movie to suggest. So any time that you throw something really left field into that into that prediction algorithm it's going to struggle to know what to do because it's modelled off how many times you've watched rom-coms, how many times you've watched action movies and things like that. So something that's completely left of centre is always going to screw with, with that type of algorithm. Um, and that, that's even true of ChatGPT, right? So when ChatGPT is doing its job, all it's trying to predict is the next best word and the next best word and the next best word. It just does it at lightning speed. Um, and I, I can test you with this, right? If you finish this statement for me, I love ice cream. Cream, yep. But you could have said coffee. You could have said fishing. You could have said hockey, right? You but, know way too much about me right now. You, I you, love ice cream. You immediately went to ice cream, as most people do. Um, but what the AI does is based on the context of the discussion is it then chooses which word to go next, but if you threw in something from completely left of center that said, I love igloo ice, it probably wouldn't go to cream. It would go to ice sculpting or ice shaping or something because of the word igloo. So anything that you can do to disrupt that pattern is, is kind of what happens. Then you get down to what's the, what's the real risk. And it's, it's, what are the real risk is different from what are people fearful of. <laughs> Fearful of uh, people are fearful of a couple of things. One is that AI becomes sentient, and you know, the robots take over, and we're all trying to find Arnold Schwarzenegger, um, and that that's that's one fear. The other fear is that yeah, you get this polarizing thing. For me, the greater risk is not around either of those things. The greater risk is around somebody writing a bad prompt, and I'll use an extreme example. If somebody wrote a prompt that said to AI. I want you to get rid of cancer. I never want another human to suffer from cancer ever again. Sounds like a very noble prompt until AI goes out and does all of the research and discovers that in actual fact, cancer cannot be cured. The only way to get rid of cancer, which is what you asked for, is to remove the hosts. Now we're removing all the humans because they are the ones that host cancer. So yeah, it, and it's, like I said, it's an extreme example. But we're, you know, we're already seeing pharmaceutical companies that are using AI to synthesize new drugs. There was a group that, just for the fun, one night when they went home, said to AI, can you synthesize a pathogen, a human pathogen? They came back six hours later and it had synthesized 40,000 pathogens. If that gets into the hands of the bad actor, the wrong, the wrong person, you've got a terrorist attack waiting to happen. So... There's more real tangible risks around bad prompting than there is around things becoming sentient or things becoming too polarizing. You make me <clears throat> I'm I'm kind of, I'm a creative person. 
which is probably why I don't have a, a real job. The, um, one of the things that I keep thinking about a lot, and I draw a correlation to what you're saying, which is you sort of in my mind were describing the genie and the three questions. Mm -hmm. You know, you ask the genie for something and it interprets your wish in, in a way that is counterintuitive. Yep. And what you, I've, I've heard a lot that one of the rules of the genie is you can't ask for more wishes. And then I recently heard someone say, first wish, ask for more genies. Mm. I think that there is something to that in what you just said, which yep. is, you know, when you're pro creating prompts, you're asking, you're asking the AI genie and depending upon what you ask it for, um, it's just an interest. It's a new way of thinking for all of us. Mm -hmm. The other thing I would say is when we talk about GPT, generative AI, and it's trying to predict ice cream or iced tea, ice maker, ice coffee, when it's making those predictions and we extrapolate that out. So a prediction in that idea is, is it's guessing something that you want in the future or, or at a moment in time. And even at its very best, the accuracy is only for the moment that it's right because That's right. the further you extrapolate these conversations, the more um, the more the last answer isn't as necessary as the one Correct. that you want next. And it also depends on the data that it's been trained on. If all we trained it on was the written essays of four-year-olds, no matter what you asked, it would want to talk about unicorns and monsters because that's all it knows. So even though this generative AI seems to be generating something from nothing, which it kind of is, it's still generating based upon what it knows to be true. And that's the big difference with humans. We can generate ideas based on stuff that we don't necessarily know. So, you know, you just said you're an artistic person and that's fantastic. You might look at a, at a wooden chair and say, well, that is a chair. But actually, if I turned it upside down and put a sheet over it, it could be a fort. That's, that, that's not something that generative AI can do because it can't think about something it hasn't already kind of seen, if that makes sense. It totally. It can, it can, I'm tracking with you, bro. It can twist what it's got, but it can't generate brand new, right, um, even though it is called generative AI. It's so much. We could talk forever. Simon, tell me um, – I, I like – I just thank you for your time today. Tell me what – people should be thinking about in 2024 with regard to all of this? Oh, uh, in 2024, companies in particular need to have done something in AI, dipped a toe in the water somewhere with AI. If they get to the end of next year and they haven't, they're likely to start getting penalized by the market. That is, customers will start gravitating to companies that are more tech savvy, that are using AI. Um, and organizations need to learn how to do that. Now, it's really frightening for a lot of organizations, especially large organizations, to entertain this for one simple reason. AI is empirical. That is, you can't think your way through it. You can't research your way through it. You've got to take off your shoes, step in the water, and have a go. And when you do that, you may fail. And most large corporations in Australia, in the US, in the UK, do not tolerate failure very well. We've been taught not to tolerate failure. But to get truly innovative, to have a real go with AI, they're going to have to start to deal with the possibilities of failing fast and all those, you know, if you look at SpaceX, all of the employees are plotting like crazy when their four million dollar rocket, forty million dollar rocket blew up. Um, that's a company that celebrates failure, that learns from failure and moves on. Most organisations are not like that, so I think there is either going to need to be a fundamental organisational shift 
which is not going to happen. Or at a minimum, companies are going to need to set up a tiger team or a you know SEAL team, whatever you want to call them, of five or ten people from multidisciplines and set them aside to work on AI and allow them to fail, allow them to trip over, allow them to make the mistakes before things go into production. Or allow them to discover. Correct. Simon, I just I could talk to you forever. Thank you so much for being on the podcast today. It was today. my joy. Hopefully, today's exploration with CX in the Wild has unearthed fresh CX insights for you. Be sure to explore previous episodes or share this podcast to invite others on our safari. Have a great suggestion or want to be on the show? Reach out to Dennis on LinkedIn. Until next time, stay curious and keep exploring the wild world of CX.